Greetings to everybody. So good evening, uh, everybody, and welcome uh, to Performing uh, Resistance, uh, Dialogues on Arts, Migration, and uh, Inclusive uh, Cities. <laughs> this evening, uh, uh, we have a dialogue between myself, Sandro Mezzadra, and Michael Hart. <laughs> The title of uh, the dialogue is uh, Mediterranean, rethinking the politics uh, of migration uh, in uh, hard times. At the center of uh, our dialogue, uh, there is uh, a specific uh, project, uh, the Mediterranean project that uh, was launched uh, two years ago and that uh, we will uh, describe uh, in detail uh, later on. It's uh, a project uh, that uh, is engaged in the politics of migration uh, in uh, the Mediterranean. The project uh, runs uh, a ship, the Mare Ionio, a migrant uh, rescue ship, <laughs> that is currently operating in the central Mediterranean. Allow me to start by uh, making uh, a connection between uh, uh, the topic of uh, our uh, dialogue uh, today and uh, the uh, huge tumultuous uh, movement uh, that has uh, uh, shaken uh, the US uh, and that uh, has also uh, had uh, important manifestations uh, uh, elsewhere in Australia and in Europe, uh, which means uh, uh, the movement uh, Black Lives Matter. Maybe there will be uh, the possibility to discuss uh, a bit more later uh, the connections between uh, Mediterranean and Black Lives Matter. For now, let me say that uh, uh, in this part of the world, uh, uh, to say Black Lives Matter uh, uh, necessarily lead to uh, focus the gaze on uh, what is happening uh, uh, at the uh, external frontiers mm. of uh, the European Union, and in particular in the Mediterranean, which means in a sea that has uh, become a huge graveyard, a sea where uh, so black mm. lives were uh, destroyed over the last uh, two uh, decades. I was just saying that the title of uh, our dialogue is Mediterranean Rethinking the Politics of Migration in Hard Times. And indeed, uh, we are living uh, in hard times uh, regarding uh, the politics of borders uh, and uh, migration. The COVID-19 crisis uh, led uh, to a further uh, hardening of borders uh, in uh, the last uh, three months. But uh, the other times uh, we refer to uh, began uh, uh, much earlier. Over the last uh, years, uh, we have uh, indeed witnessed uh, an, a hardening uh, of borders uh, in many parts of the world, which means uh, not only in Europe, uh, and particularly in the Mediterranean, uh, but also, for instance, in the US, uh, in the borderlands between uh, the US uh, and Mexico, uh, or uh, in the Bay of Bengal, uh, regarding uh, uh, the movements of uh, Rohingya uh, refugees. Uh, 
examples uh, could be easily multiplied. The point is that uh, uh, the hardening of borders uh, has been uh, really a global trend in uh, the last uh, years. In Europe, uh, it is uh, relatively easy to uh, point to a threshold in uh, this uh, regard, which means uh, what uh, activists and uh, critical migration scholars uh, call uh, the long summer of migration in 2015. You may remember uh, that uh, in uh, 2015, uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of migrants and refugees crossed the Aegean Sea and moved uh, across the, the so-called uh, Balkan route uh, up to uh, Central uh, Europe. It was a moment uh, of... Uh, insurgency in the politics uh, of migration. It was a radical challenge to the European uh, border regime that invited a kind of uh, a profound reorganization of uh, the European border regime, which also means uh, of the relations between Europe and its multiple uh, outsides. We know very well uh, that uh, the response of uh, European uh, nation states uh, and uh, of uh, the European uh, Union uh, did not go in that direction. Uh, walls, uh, barbed wire uh, proliferated, uh, first of all, across uh, the Balkan route, and then also in the very center of uh, the European space, where uh, uh, so-called Schengen borders were selectively closed. <laughs> to put it shortly, what uh, we experienced in the wake of uh, the long summer uh, of migration was a renationalization of uh, border controls uh, and uh, politics. And part and parcel of this uh, renationalization of border controls and politics was uh, the criminalization of uh, humanitarian intervention. We will come uh, to this point uh, later because uh, it was, uh, in a way, the starting point uh, for uh, the Mediterranean uh, project. Let me just say a couple of words about uh, uh, the criminalization of uh, humanitarian mm -hmm. uh, intervention. Mm -hmm. It was indeed uh, a quite a radical break mm -hmm with uh, the uh, development uh, of uh, border politics uh, in Europe since the, the late uh, 1990s. Since the late 1990s, uh, uh, there was a clear governmental twist of uh, the humanitarian reason, to uh, mention the title of an important book by Didier Fassin. And this uh, uh, means that uh, humanitarian actors and logics uh, had become uh, part and parcel of uh, the border regime uh, in uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, say a couple of words uh, regarding uh, the notion of border regime that uh, I have uh, mentioned uh, of a couple of times uh, until uh, now. Uh, scholars, uh, critical scholars, uh, employing uh, the notion of border regime uh, emphasize uh, 
its uh, heterogeneous and tense constitution. Mm. The multiple actors uh, and uh, logics uh, that uh, compose the border uh, regime. And if you look at uh, uh, Europe, uh, since uh, the 1990s, uh, uh, border regimes uh, have uh, uh, evolved uh, uh, within the framework of conflicts and tensions between humanitarianism, economic valorization and mi of migration and uh, security. Mm. Humanitarianism was a component of uh, the border regime. Mm. After the long summer of uh, migration in 2015, humanitarianism was removed from the assemblage of the border regime and it was criminalized. This led to a situation in which border crossing, particularly in the Mediterranean, became more and more dangerous uh, and uh, even uh, lethal. Just a uh, couple of uh, words more uh, to conclude this first uh, intervention. As I was trying uh, to uh, show, uh, the nexus between uh, migration and uh, borders uh, has uh, become a highly politicized uh, nexus. Uh, around this nexus, everyday struggles are uh, uh, fought. Uh, and uh, what is at stake in uh, uh, these struggles uh, are questions of life uh, and death. In front of uh, this uh, situation, uh, it is important to stress that uh, a new generation of activist scholars uh, engaged in uh, the critical analysis of uh, the border and migration nexus uh, and uh, in the politics of uh, migration and uh, borders. If you take uh, important sites in the geography of uh, border and migration uh, control in Europe, uh, from Lesbos to Ceuta Melilla, from Ventimiglia to Calais, each of these sites has been a site uh, of uh, uh, research and activist intervention in the last uh, years. Mm. Of course, uh, this uh, new generation of uh, activist uh, scholars uh, has uh, negotiated uh, uh, the uh, relationship uh, with uh, the uh, kind of booming uh, field uh, of uh, border and uh, migration uh, studies uh, in uh, the uh, academy. And many of uh, these uh, activist uh, scholars uh, have been influenced by uh, a specific strand in uh, critical migration uh, and uh, border studies the so-called autonomy of migration approach. This is uh, an approach that emphasizes uh, the subjective dimension of uh, migration and that leads uh, to a politicization of the border as a field uh, of uh, struggle. This is uh, a very important point uh, also regarding uh, the Mediterranean project. Hmm. The Mediterranean project uh, emerges uh, in a situation characterized uh, by the criminalization of humanitarianism. 
it has uh, a uh, kind of complex uh, relationship with uh, humanitarianism. In a way, it is part of the field of uh, humanitarian intervention. In another way, it is uh, not part of that field. It is rather quite critical with respect to uh, some distinctive features of humanitarianism. Humanitarianism tends to frame the subjects that it rescues through the notion of victimhood. The rhetoric of victimhood is very important for humanitarianism. Well, consistently with what I was saying about the autonomy of migration approach, the Mediterranean project emphasizes the agency of migrants. The Mediterranean project uh, uh, repeats again and again that uh, it is in a way led by uh, the uh, courage, by the stubbornness of uh, migrants uh, at uh, sea. Mm -hmm. I think this is uh, a first aspect uh, that uh, uh, characterizes uh, the Mediterranean project uh, uh, and that distinguishes it uh, from, uh, let's say, mainstream uh, humanitarianism. Michael. Good. So um, my, uh, if Sandro and I have, I have planned to go back and forth twice, you know, so that we'll have uh, each of us speaking twice. And our hope is that we'll stop about uh, 10 minutes to the hour so that we would have 40 minutes uh, for discussion. So please, along the way, put comments, questions in the um, in the live comments section. We'll be able to then uh, address them when Sandra and I finish the, um, what we have planned. Um, so it's my it's my task right now. After Sandra has given a, a more general introduction to uh, migration studies and the and the problematics of migration, especially in Europe, is to give um, an introduction to the project of Mediterranean itself. Um, and for those of you who are not in Italy, I um, will probably not not know as much or maybe anything about the project. One of the things I wanted to emphasize though, or even to question, going along with something that Sandra was saying earlier, is that the project started very much recognizing it was swimming against the current. Uh, it has to do with what Sandra was talking about with hard times, you know, that uh, swimming against the current, meaning in the context of uh, right-wing populist projects in Europe, anti-migrant projects, not only in Italy and Europe, but also uh, elsewhere, as Sandra was saying, and I'm questioning, this is what I'd like to come around to, if, if perhaps we're, we're, the context is changing so that we might find ourselves swimming with the current um, and, that, and what the consequences of that would be. I'm thinking really about the uh, protest movements in the US and, and in Europe in the recent weeks. Okay, so the Project Mediterranean in general is, is a, a project for the rescue mission, re re rescuing migrants, in difficulty at sea, um, but it's also an anti-racist project, and and I would I would say that in in most contexts it's very difficult to separate migration questions from race, and so um, and so seeing it I think as an anti-racist project, especially in the Italian context, is uh, is quite important. And the project started almost exactly two years ago. I mean, started in the sense of uh, the idea was hatched in the summer of 2018. Um, it was hatched among a, a, a small group of activists, almost all Italian. Um, and and the, the context was important. Um, it was a context in which uh, Matteo Salvini, then the interior minister and um, the deputy prime minister was waging a campaign, as Sandra was saying, against migrants and against all those who aid them. So there were a, a number of 
uh, incidents in that summer, two years ago, uh, 2018, that really set the context uh, for us, both um, of the Italian government at the time blocking migrants and also criminalizing those who, who attempted to aid them. Uh, one, for instance, was the uh, rescue ship Aquarius, um, which was a ship that was run by the Doctors Without Borders and SOS Mediterranean, uh, had 600 migrants aboard, and the Italian government refused entry into port in Italy. Um, there was also an Italian Coast Guard ship during that same summer, the Dicciotti, um, which itself had 170 migrants. And of course, the Coast Guard ship could port in Italy. The Italian government couldn't refuse, refuse porting it, but for quite some time refused the debarkation of the migrants. Um, and so these are just two examples of the ways in which in the summer of 2018, uh, humanitarian NGOs that were aiding and rescuing migrants at sea were being disallowed. And it seemed like, and in fact, it was an enormous reduction of the possibility in the central Mediterranean of uh, rescuing of rescuing migrants. So it seemed in that context that, um, that the project was born. I mean, the, the, we, we, we thought, you know, one has to do something. In fact, the, the project against the current in the same way, we're, we're thinking that almost as a, um, not, not merely a symbolic effort, I mean, because important, of course the work it does of rescuing migrants is important, but demonstrating that even in the worst times, uh, even when they're seemingly criminalized and dis disallowed, that one can nonetheless construct such a project. So then what what uh, what what we did, what the group did was to um, to buy a boat, the Mare Ionio, uh, an old tugboat, to buy it with in some ways with with our money, but then the major part coming from a, a, a loan from the Banca Etica, um, a Spanish and Italian bank that that helps humanitarian and 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 activist projects. Um, and so bought the boat and uh, and set out by October of 2018 to monitor and to conduct rescues um, in the central Mediterranean. I guess I wanted to, there were a couple of things that, that struck me at the time that were uh, interesting. In some ways, the, the project wasn't as against the current as I was first imagining it. One of them was that um, those who were equipping the ship, you know, because uh, repairs had to be done before it go out, many practical things. Um, Sandro, together with uh, others, Bette Caccia, Luca Casadini, one thing that hearing their experiences, because I was in the US, I wasn't involved in any of this stuff. Um, hearing their experience really struck me is that people in the shipyards, people in all kinds of uh, shipping, fitting industries, you know, that they had to work with, through, were surprisingly, almost uniformly, in favor of the mission. In fa because there was a profound, this is what I, I learned, a profound respect for all of those who go at sea for the need to, the obligation to, rescue all those who are in distress. And so I learned what they all knew, that there's a, a, a kind of law of the sea that requires um, that everyone rescue those at sea. So in fact, this is the way in the beginning, I was interested that it's not my way of thinking usually, but some in the part in part of Mediterranean, many wanted to construct it as a civil obedience project. I mean, we were used to civil disobedience and I'm fine with that. You know, like, it, in fact, I prefer it. But but in this case, it was the government who's breaking the laws, breaking international law, breaking these conventional laws of the sea by refusing, uh, to do what is their obligation, which is to rescue those uh, who are in distress at sea and to return them to a safe port. Sandro and I have been very interested all, all along the way in many of these legal questions about international law, et cetera. We could get into those later, but I think it's probably better for me to go on to other things. Oh, and then I should also point out, you know, so it's not just this network of seafaring people that were very uh, favorable to it. Mediterranea is not just the ship, of course. In fact, the majority of the work of Mediterranea is on land, um, constructing a series of 
of debates, demonstrations, um, information. Um, it's a, a, a huge project and in that sense too, in Italy, you know, primarily. Um, in that sense too, I think the project activated uh, uh, a wide population of all of those who do, who are against the government and European, Italian government and European policies about migration and um, want to struggle for, for them. Okay, uh, that was 2018 when the project started, like I said, in October of 2018. In 2019, several times, um, the boat rescued migrants, uh, for instance, once uh, 49 people, another 29 people, 59 people a third time. Um, and you also, you know, it's worth recognizing these are not huge numbers. There's only so much. I mean, when one thinks about the, the thousands of people who die in the central Mediterranean, these are not huge numbers. So it's, it, but it's not just, I mean, it's important. You're not, you know, it, it's an important work, but it's also recognizing the um, current state of affairs of migration in, in, the, um, in the central Mediterranean. Okay, so during after each of these rescues, in line with this theme that we've been developing about criminalization protests, uh, in practical terms, each time that the, the Mariglionio, the Medi Mediterranean ship, uh, rescued migrants, each time it brought them to port, uh, the ship was impounded by the government, the captain and the chief of mission were both held for questioning, all on suspicion of uh, illegal aid to migrants or even worse, suspicion of trafficking. Um, each time eventually a judge released them, but that there was um, significant, what should you say, government um, shutdown of the project each time. Um, now, as Sandro said just last week, you know, of course there's a virus pause. You couldn't take out the ship during the, um, during the lockdown of the virus, but but the the Mari Ionio is now back at sea. There's just a few things I should I should uh, turn to Sandro soon, but I just wanted to emphasize a few things about the new context. And I'm wondering about the within the with the current now, because Sandro had mentioned the um, the protests following the murder of George Floyd, and I'm trying to think about the context in which Mari Ionio now fits or Mediterranean now fits. Um, it seems to be important to recognize that the protests in the U.S. over the last few weeks have not just been about police violence. Um, in fact, police violence seems to me that the, the symptom or the epiphenomenon for the real problem, and the, the, the protests in my view have been quite sophisticated about this, which is the social structures of racism in the U.S. Now, it's, it's, it seems to me it's on this level that there's been the kind of communication, international transversal communication of the struggles. Because as Sandro was mentioned before, the, the, the demonstrations in Britain and France and in Italy, also in Australia, et cetera. And, and it seems to me that this connection is not just, first of all, it's not just solidarity with uh, uh, Black Americans. I mean, it is that, or it can be that, but, and it's also not just about local police violence against people of color, which of course in all these countries is, um, is also a horrible phenomenon. I think it's more at the level of a recognition of the uh, structures of racism in each of these societies. Like that's actually the primary target and the target at which there's the kind of communication among them. So um, the recognition of, um, of that connection among the structures of racism seems to me has the potential to activate in Europe, like in the United States. These are the kind of things we'll have to see as the months and the weeks and months continue, a much broader analysis of those, uh, those social structures of racism and how to confront them. And like I said earlier, I, I, I see it. I, I think Sandra is actually much more expert than I about talking about this, the, that when considering race, that when considering these uh, borders and and migration policies, and, and especially the criminalization, you know, both of migrants and of those who aid migrants, it's almost impossible not to also think about race and to think about those structures of racism. So that's what I would like. I mean, I'm wondering the sense in which in the US, certainly the context has shifted. 
And I'm wondering in the sense in which it would in Europe too. Um, yeah, I wonder if there's one here. Let me permit one more thing, because then I'll, I'll say less than later, maybe. It could just it seem to me that, okay, I hope I can do this right. You know, I I, I was thinking about the, the, because partly these demonstrations make us think about questions about race in the US and, and, your, and race in Europe. Um, you know, in the US, I've long found people in different parts of the country see all the other parts of the country as more racist than them. And as I've different times moved to live different parts of the country, I keep getting, I don't know, I moved from Los Angeles after the riots to the, the, the Southeast. And people here said, you know, first of all, I was leaving LA and they said, oh my God, you're going to the Southeast, they're so racist there. And then I got to North Carolina and they said, oh my God, you came from LA, they're so racist there. And then it's like, everyone thinks that the other. And so I came to the conclusion that all the regions of the US are just as racist. It just comes in different flavors or qualities. Anyway, I had the same experience with the U.S. and Europe. Like I moved to, I moved to France and the French people said, oh my God, the U you were in the U.S., how could you stand it so racist there? And I was like, fuck, didn't you see what's happening in Paris right now? You know, like it seems like, and so similarly, I think, with thinking, I, the same way I was thinking about regions in the U.S., that I don't know if this one should apply this to everyone in the world, but certainly North America and Europe, um, I would say something like the same it's almost a stupid way of saying it. The same quantity of racism, it just takes a different different permutations. And what I'm hoping is, so this is a long way around to get around to the, the phenomenon that Sandra was mentioning at the outset. What I'm hoping is, is in some ways this communication, like a kind of you know, spark and fires passing of these demonstrations in recent weeks could be ways of recognizing the common nature of the racism that takes different forms in these different societies. And that in some ways attacking one requires attacking the others too. There you go. Um, and so I wanted to cast uh, Mediterranean in this context, you know, as an anti-racist project, um, it's certainly attacking the border regimes and the uh, anti-migrant policies, but I think in a, in a larger frame, it's also questioning and, and, and shining a light on uh, certain racial regimes. Sandra, I pass to you. Ah, hold on, I, here, on, there we go. Thank you, Michael. Mm. Yes, uh, Mediterranean uh, is definitely a, an anti-racist uh, uh, project. Mm. It is more generally a project enmeshed in the politics of migration. Migration has been in the last decades uh, uh, a crucial field of uh, struggle and resistance in many parts of the world, including Italy and other uh, European uh, countries. So which is the relationship between uh, the Mediterranean project uh, and uh, the struggles uh, of uh, migration? This is uh, uh, an important question because uh, Mediterranean uh, is uh, an instance uh, of uh, border activism. There are many other instances of border activism in Europe, but also in the US and Mexico, for instance. I will just mention another example, the neo-abolitionist project Alarm Phone Watch the Map. It's a neo-abolitionist project, uh, meaning that it refers back to uh, the struggle against slavery in North America, and in particular uh, to uh, the experience of uh, the Underground Railroad and uh, flight uh, assistance. Sometimes uh, 
border activism, particularly when uh, it is framed in uh, humanitarian terms, tends to be separated from uh, the politics uh, of uh, migration tends to specialize on uh, borders. Mediterranean, to the contrary, has uh, emphasized uh, since its uh, inception, Michael was uh, saying that, uh, the need to build bridges between uh, sea and uh, land. Mediterranean has uh, maritime and land crews. Mediterranean looks at the border uh, from the angle uh, of uh, the politics of migration uh, in Italy and uh, in uh, Europe. And when it is uh, operating uh, at sea, it looks at the land uh, from the point of view of the bridges that it aims uh, to build. But let me uh, mention uh, three important instances uh, of migrant struggles uh, in and around Italy over the last uh, few weeks in the time of the pandemic uh, to give you an idea of the width and uh, heterogeneity of uh, the politics of migration, of uh, migrant uh, struggles. First example, at an unbearable cost, migrants continue to challenge the border regime in the central Mediterranean during the COVID-19 crisis. And the autonomy of migration approach that I was uh, shortly describing before allows us to politicize that challenge, allows us to speak of border struggles, and border struggles are migrant struggles. A second example. On May 21st, there was a general strike of migrant workers employed in agriculture in Italy. That was, in a way, a kind of traditional labor struggle, but it was a labor struggle that immediately uh, raised the question of the relation between production and reproduction, both from the point of view of uh, the food supply chain and from the point of view of the living conditions of uh, migrant uh, workers in uh, agriculture. Mm. A third example, a third example uh, of uh, migrant struggles in Italy in the time of pandemic is the leading role of uh, second generation migrants in the mobilizations uh, under uh, the eating uh, Black Lives Matter. And those mobilizations uh, raised uh, in Italy uh, questions of citizenship uh, and racism uh, that ultimately referred back to what is happening uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, but are uh, crucial questions uh, on land. This is what uh, Michael was saying uh, before. The huge demonstrations uh, uh, under the heading uh, Black Lives Matter were not uh, simply demonstrations in solidarity with the Black Americans. Mm -hmm. There was uh, a labor of translation. Mm -hmm. And I think this is uh, a very important uh, point. So just think of these three examples. Mm -hmm. The challenge mm -hmm. to the border regime in the Mediterranean. 
the general strike of migrant workers in agriculture, the leading role of uh, second generation migrants in uh, the mobilization of the last uh, two weeks uh, under the heading Black Lives Matter. You have a quite heterogeneous and very rich, very interesting political field. And many more struggles and mundane practices of resistance could be mentioned. Struggles revolving around the right to stay, the question of housing, the absolute gender peculiarity of migrant domestic and care labor, cultural practices to build a home in the new country and to negotiate transnational relations with another home in the country of origin, daily confrontations with racism. So if one takes uh, all uh, these uh, movements, uh, issues, uh, and struggles together, it is easy to understand the deeply political nature of uh, migration. And the reasons why, as uh, I was saying before, so many young and also less young activist scholars engage in the study and the politics of migration. And particularly in hard times when all the new forms of nationalism threaten to radically limit migrant freedom around borders as well as within them. So if uh, there is uh, a shift in uh, the current conjuncture, as uh, Michael uh, was uh, uh, wishing. Uh, <laughs> for, uh, <laughs> uh, we must uh, be able to uh, repeat uh, the words uh, of uh, George Floyd and Eric Gartner. Uh, we can't breathe, uh, referring those words uh, also to uh, the old and new forms uh, of uh, nationalism that uh, surround uh, us. So just uh, to conclude, a deeply political uh, uh, field. Speaking of migration uh, uh, necessarily means uh, speaking of the politics of uh, migration. And there are, of course, uh, several uh, theoretical lenses uh, that one can employ uh, to make sense of this, uh, let's say, politicality of uh, migration. You can look at uh, migration through the lens of human rights, uh, through the lens of citizenship, through the lens of racism, or through the lens of labor power. I think that these four conceptual keywords give an idea of the kind of effort to theoretically make sense of the politics of migration in uh, current uh, critical uh, debates. And I am convinced uh, that uh, the best way uh, to handle uh, these uh, conceptual labels uh, is to use them in a non-exclusive uh, way. Although uh, I tend to privilege the lens of a non-economistic uh, reading of the notion of uh, labor power. But this opens up a whole set of new problems that I will be, of course, happy to address in the discussion if uh, you are uh, interested. Michael. So my task with this last section is to that we we thought of as utopian vision, or or you can think of them really also as uh, 
just um, maybe guiding principles. Yeah, put it that way. And we just had three, uh, or I have three that I wanted to talk through. One is about internationalism, a second about freedom of movement, and a third about open borders. Um, so the first is that we, we've tended to think of uh, the, the various migration movements in recent years taken together as a kind of internationalist insurgency. And in this way, the, uh, a, a, a movement, I'll say more in a minute by what kind of movement I'm talking about, but anyway, a movement that, in, that takes up the legacy of the great 20th century internationalisms. You know, think of uh, Bandung in the 1950s or of uh, the Tricontinental in the Great Havana meetings in 1966. I mean, these, are, these were internationalist projects, primarily state-run internationalist projects. Um, and in order to see the migrations or the, the great mosaic of all of these migrations uh, that have been taking place over recent years as, uh, as a form of internationalism, you could start by recognizing the way that these uh, migrations undermine national sovereignties and break down various walls, uh, challenging border regimes. So objectively, the migrant uh, movements are doing this. Immediately, my, and so in that sense, internationalist, um, not internationalist in the sense of, uh, of uh, Fidel together with the leaders of Yugoslavia and Indonesia. No, it's not that. It's, uh, it's instead a, um, a popular or from, from below form of internationalism. There you go. Um, that it's so breaking down national sovereignties, challenging the border regime. It's obviously a strange kind of insurgency because, as you well know, um, migrants themselves are seldom can seldom give a political explanation for their movements, um, even if they do uh, think of them in that in those larger ways. I think when to see this as an insurgency, and also that there's no there's no central organization or almost never any organization at all of these various migrant movements. So it isn't a project of which the migrants are, are, are uh, in some sense consciously part. I think one has to see as an insurgent rather in, kind of in objective terms. If you step back and look at these movements and their objective effects, one sees them as having the effects of breaking down national sovereignties and of um, breaking down the obstacles to an internationalist um, project. You know, you might also think of it as insurgency in another way, which is that that way uh, Marx says somewhere that, you know, sometimes uh, reactionaries are more useful to read than so-called revolutionaries. Well, you know, the, the right wing, the reactionaries are always calling this an insurgency. You know, in the U.S. in particular, you know, like uh, Mexicans coming in caravans, they're, you know, they're, and so they're imagining it. And I think in some sense, this is what I'm saying, maybe unconsciously, they're in some ways right. Even if there is no, as they're imagining some sort of conspiracy or plot, that there's an effect of uh, a kind of insurgency. Anyway, that's the first thing. And, and it relates to um, when Sandro mentioned earlier, the deeply political nature of migration struggles. You know, both of the people who are studying and working with migrants, but are the migrants themselves. This is, in a way, trying to grasp that. So that was the first one about uh, an internationalist insurgency or a form of internationalism, etc. The second about freedom of movement is maybe easier to understand from the beginning because um, this is something that Sandra says often that, that migrants themselves are always talking about freedom at any demonstration when they first arrive, when they are, when the demonstration of freedom is always the, the primary um, concept, primary political concept. And it's, um, I think it's useful to think of freedom of movement, which the migrants themselves are affirming and demonstrating as a primary political freedom. Like one might even think of the freedom of movement as, as to take this perspective, the standpoint of the freedom of movement as, as the freedom from which other freedoms follow. Um, and maybe we can put it another way that one might try to rethink the other freedoms other freedoms that, that, that are talked about in, in left political discourse as being based on or, or indebted to uh, 
uh, the freedom of movement. Or here's another way of thinking about it: is that that if uh, if we if one sustains the freedom of movement, if one uh, um, believes that it is an important political ideal, then one has to accept uh, a politics of free migration as um, as a consequence of being true to those ideals. Okay, uh, uh, that was. I think that flows directly into it's better expressed maybe in terms of the third, which is about open borders. And, and I thought maybe this could be useful um, to thinking about the connection with the uh, contemporary movements, which Sandro and I have come back to regularly because you know they're on our mind. I assume they're on your mind too. Um, the the current movements in the U.S. and 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 in Europe and elsewhere um, under the rubric of Black Lives Matter seems to me that maybe one should think open borders in some sense like the uh, mandates to defund the police or more generally to abolish the prison um, complex. Uh, you know, this way is putting it when Sandra was saying that Alarm Phone and, and these other projects in the, in the context of um, the autonomy of migration perspective are neo-abolitionist projects. I think this is already posing that, posing that link. But there's another ways which I thought this was similar. Like when, if you think about defund the police and open borders in relation to it as a thing, I, the first thing is a stupid thing to say, but it's true, you know, which is that um, public opinion on these issues can really change quickly. And so militating on the basis of some of these ideals, even when it seems like we end up hitting our head against a wall, can sometimes change. And that's one thing we've seen remarkable in the last few weeks uh, within the Black Lives Matter in the US is how uh, the shift uh, with regard to, for instance, the defunding of the police or transforming police forces or reducing police forces, et cetera. Um, so the question with open borders, I think is not a, um, what should you say, a lost cause, but one should. The second one is uh, to recognize how this is what I've been saying throughout, and, and, and Sandro, too, that fundamentally this question about borders, like the question about policing and prisons, is based fundamentally on a racist foundation. And so uh, I think that's an important um, connection to maintain and, a, and, and even a, a, a back, you know, a stepping back um, perspective to have on it. Um, a third is, is that like the question of the police and the prison, the question, the opposition to open borders is primarily supported by unfounded fears. Um, you know, with, the, with defunding the police or abolish the prisons, uh, w w what I mean by unfounded fears is, uh, you know, with, uh, with less police or less people in prison, there'll be social chaos that criminals are running amok, blah, blah, you, you can imagine the whole thing. But it's similar, I think, with open borders. I mean, that it's it's uh, the opposition to it is primary. The reason it seems outside of the possible discourse is that it's uh, uh, are are a series of unfounded fears, because in fact, most people don't want to leave where they're from, or most migrants uh, want to return to where they're from. I mean, think about this is just a, a, a common example. Most most of uh, men in West African countries who want to come to Europe, they want to make some money, they want to have an adventure, but they want to then go back home. Um, and so one of the things, in fact, that the borders do is make this kind of circulation difficult. What I mean by that about most people don't want to, it, people don't want to leave where they're from or don't want to, um, or want to return to where they're from. Partly what we're, what we're talking about here is just that, you know, I don't know, most Danish people maybe want to go to Dakar, but they want to go for a visit. They want to move there. Then they want to go back to Copenhagen. And it's a similar thing with the people from Dakar who want to go to Copenhagen. Um, they want to return back. And that's what, and say, if, in what we're, uh, what the question of open borders is, uh, is provo proposing is, maybe this is just an elaboration of the second point about the freedom of movement, is that um, in a philosophical sense, people should be able to freely move to where they want. And open borders is really just a, a way of, um, of um, facilitating that. 
I guess I should bring up one other thing that's similar, I think, with these mandates of abolish the prison and defund the police with open borders is um, another obstacle to all of these discussions has often been uh, casting them in the absolute that then disqualifies them as a possibility. So for instance, when Angela Davis, one of the major proponents of uh, prison abolitionism or most, most uh, intelligent, widely, widely listened to one, what she always says is that what the prison should be abolished as the primary form of punishment in society. It doesn't mean that, the, that no one will be confined in any way. And all, similarly with defund the police, this is primarily a way of reimagining how um, um, policing, if you want, or, or maintenance of social um, peace will be accomplished. And so I think a similar thing about uh, the question of open borders and affirming the, uh, the freedom of movement is that what it requires doing is opening, reopening a uh, thought process about what the um, channels of and conditions for movement will be based on the principle of freedom. So let me stop, I'll stop there. I think we're in, we're in reasonable time. I, what I just wanted to pose is maybe, I don't know if they're, they're not even provocations, I don't think, just three principles by which uh, um, Sandro and I, and many others have thought about the, the question of internationalism. Third is about freedom of movement. And in some ways, as I talked about, I realized maybe open borders and freedom of movement ought, ought to be thought together. These are just some ways of, um, yeah, how should I say, you know, uh, I often get, we often get when we're posing in critical uh, perspective and a perspective of protest, people often say, well, well, what do you propose? Like, what's your alternative? Okay, well, this is our alternative. There you go. Um, or at least a way of, of principles for thinking about an alternative. Sandra, did you want, uh, did you have um, more concluding remarks before we um, turn to people's comments? No, I think we should turn uh, to people's comments. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, quite a few. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, thank you. Go ahead. No, no, no. I didn't. I, I need to. I need to read them. I'm sorry that I'm. I'm catching. Yes, up. yes. I, I just read uh, uh, the comment uh, and question by Lenny. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding uh, uh, border activism. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, in Europe, at least, uh, but not only in Europe, uh, uh, the trend uh, is uh, precisely toward uh, the forging of uh, new, let's say, institutions, uh, or maybe even better, infrastructures of uh, resistance. Mm. I think that uh, uh, Mediterranean is an infrastructure of uh, resistance. Or take Alarm Phone, uh, the neo-abolitionist project uh, that uh, I was uh, mentioning before. The Alarm Phone is a multi-sided hotline uh, uh, which uh, uh, gets uh, uh, calls uh, from uh, migrants uh, in distress. Mm. It is active 24-7. Uh, mm. This is another uh, crucial important infrastructure of uh, resistance. Mm. Moreover, if you look at uh, migrants' uh, struggles, uh, uh, in particular uh, in Italy, you can also uh, speak of uh, uh, new infrastructures uh, emerging, from, for instance, uh, from uh, struggles for housing, from occupations. Mm. 
there are uh, important uh, grassroots uh, unions that uh, are uh, uh, basically uh, migrant unions in Italy, but also elsewhere uh, in Europe and in the world. So there is a trend toward the forging of uh, institutions. And I think that also uh, the uh, movement uh, in uh, the US, uh, the BLM uh, struggles uh, are characterized by a dense uh, fabric of uh, experiences uh, that we can read through the lens of uh, uh, institution uh, slash uh, infrastructure. Uh, mm. But let me add to conclude that I think that the question uh, asked by Lenny uh, is for me a very important question. Mm. I wanted to address this one by uh, Maru Abebe. Um, how, permanently, how permanently migrant origin states are assisted to stop such waves of exodus of youth. And, um, you know, partly I wanted to respond just to, from my own process of education. Um, because when I, I, when I was involved in migrant uh, questions in the U.S. in my many years ago, in in my twenties, regarding Central America, and the discourse primarily was then, and rightly so, about the U.S. funding of wars in Central America and the creation of the wave of migrants coming to the U.S. And so, I, I and, then, and I'm taking um, this question in a way to be thinking about that, the way that Europe and North America create the context that drive these waves of migration through wars, through famines, through um, economic imperialism, et cetera. Um, but one of the things I learned, and this is from Sandro, from others working in migration studies like Sandro, is that this focus on the, the, the causes of migration can often lead to a, um, a, a political trap, it seems to me. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to express this right, which is to distinguish, uh, forcing one to distinguish between uh, legitimate um, migrants, refugees, and the others who are illegitimate uh, migrants. That seems important to me, or this is what I just I'm trying to propose is something I've learned, and, and maybe I'm mistaking Maru's um, point in this, which is that it seems important to me to um, recognize and validate all desires for migration, rather that you know that someone shouldn't be treated differently um, if they are coming because uh, they've been persecuted in their own country because they're victims of war, or if they've fleeing, um, well, of course, an abusive husband, but also just um, you know broke up with their boyfriend and want to leave or, or even see, seek adventure. Like, I think that this is part of the, when I was saying before to recognize the freedom of movement is fundamental is to shift the view from uh, migration regimes that divide between legitimate and illegitimate migrants and, um, and those that don't, you know, and clearly I realize that I'm going, I'm, 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 I'm working, I'm not um, addressing directly Maru's point, and I and I'm, Maru might completely agree with things I said. I, and I agree, of course, that um, that making it so people don't have to leave is is certainly a political important point. I just wanted to point out my own um, process of um, education around this to um, to. Yeah, let's say avoid a certain kinds of political traps that I think certain thoughts about migration fit into. So let let me take uh, the question uh, asked uh, by Martina, who um, 
emphasizes uh, the heterogeneity hmm, of uh, the Mediterranean platform. And that's a very important point. I would say that uh, uh, since the beginning uh, in Mediterranean, we uh, forged uh, a very specific method, hmm, a very inclusive method. Hmm. We were able uh, to uh, speak uh, to unions, to civil society uh, organizations, hmm, to political parties, to the church. The church played uh, a quite important role uh, in uh, Mediterranean, particularly in uh, the last month. Hmm. So I ask with Martina whether uh, this uh, inclusive uh, method uh, can be a tool that allows us uh, to uh, build uh, alliances uh, and coalitions uh, even beyond uh, the experience of uh, Mediterranean. It's a quite a different uh, situation, I know, but uh, uh, heterogeneity is also a crucial hallmark uh, of uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, struggles uh, in the United States. It is precisely this heterogeneity that uh, characterizes uh, uh, the current uh, conjuncture of uh, struggle in the US and that distinguishes it not only from uh, the 60s or uh, the 92 uh, riots in LA, but also from uh, uh, the Ferguson moment in 2014, mm -hmm. 2015. Mm -hmm. Heterogeneity requires uh, <laughs> kind of inclusive uh, method. <laughs> of course, inclusive method is a very general kind of definition. We should uh, be uh, much more uh, precise. <laughs> but uh, uh, reading uh, about uh, Black Lives Matter uh, in the US uh, in the past two weeks, I was really struck by, uh, let's say, uh, the multiplication of intersectional uh, relations uh, within hmm, the movement or the, the movement uh, in uh, plural. So I think that uh, this uh, question of uh, heterogeneity, to put it uh, very quickly, is uh, a crucial uh, uh, political uh, uh, question uh, nowadays, uh, and we need a method uh, to come to grips with uh, this heterogeneity, uh, to, to transform uh, heter heterogeneity into something that makes us more powerful and not into something that divides us, to quote Audre Lord. Mm -hmm. Sandro, I'm interested in that, and I wonder if, it led just to help me think further through that, one of the things I've been thinking about the U.S. Black Lives Matter uh, movement being impressed, like you said, about the heterogeneity, um, and the difference even with the, the Ferguson moment, you know, from three, four years ago, was, um, was a matter of education, education, political education. You know, I don't just mean university education, but, uh, you know, there are a lot more young but at least in my experience in the last few weeks, a lot more young white activists than there were after Ferguson. And I think my experience is that there, that young white activists have learned enough about the functioning of racism, enough about the um, nature of anti-racist struggle that they've been able to participate. You know, so that the heterogeneity has been due to a kind of education, similar to, like you said about uh, intersectionality, you know, the, 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 the demonstration in Brooklyn about Black Trans Lives Matter or other consciousness of intersectionality and the need for it in the movement has also been the result of a kind of education. So anyway, all that said, I wanted to try to link that to the um, question in Mediterranean and even the question with the um, the church or the heterogeneity of the movement, do you think that that functions because of a kind of um, successful political education? 
like that's what it seems to me the heterogeneity requires is the kind of um, recognition. Anyway, do you think that there can be that that um, parallel formation? Or is maybe my emphasis on education or what I'm calling education here not the right way of posing the question about heterogeneity? Uh, you know, it depends on the way in which uh, you understand education. I mean, if uh, you think uh, of education in terms of schools uh, and universities, uh, I think uh, it uh, plays an important role in uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, nowadays, uh, as uh, you explained in a very recent interview. In the case of Mediterranean, uh, it doesn't play uh, a real uh, role. What plays a role is... Uh, uh, Education in another sense, which means uh, uh, the accumulation of experiences in uh, many years of uh, political activism that uh, has led to um, focus on the need to forge an inclusive uh, method mm -hmm. and uh, to look for uh, what unites people and not for the, what uh, divides people. You know. mm -hmm. uh, so in this sense, uh, I think uh, we can speak of education. Mm -hmm. Right. No, that totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. Sandra, I think that uh, Katarina's question is one that you would be best to take at least, um, I don't see the end of the question here, but the um, but the question about migrant strike. Yes, that, that is also another question, the question by Sarah, but uh, uh, I don't uh, uh, see the end uh, uh, of uh, the question. I don't see the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There must be a limit on the number of characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, here too, it's when it's posed on screen, we, we don't get after. Um... Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I remember before the comment, so uh, maybe I can uh, I can say something uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, Sarah's uh, comment. Uh, basically, the two quotes that uh, uh, she um, uh, offers to us uh, uh, have to do with the question of uh, uh, history and particularly with uh, uh, national socialism in uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. To put it shortly, uh, of course, I think that uh, history matters. Mm -hmm. uh, let me read the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, history matters, <laughs> and uh, the elaboration uh, of uh, memory is uh, an important uh, political uh, issue. Uh, in these days, uh, uh, we have uh, the hidden debate uh, regarding uh, statues uh, and monuments, uh, that uh, uh, raises the question of the elaboration of uh, uh, memory from a very specific uh, uh, point of view. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, you have uh, to be aware of the fact that uh, uh, the elaboration of memory uh, is something uh, that uh, doesn't uh, work uh, in a straightforward uh, way. Mm. The uh, easiest example uh, is uh, uh, the migratory experience uh, of uh, Italians uh, in uh, the last 150 years. You, know. mm. you could think uh, that uh, uh, the elaboration of that memory uh, would be an antidote uh, against the racism uh, 
uh, in the present, uh, but it doesn't work uh, uh, that way. Even history is, of course, uh, a field uh, of uh, struggle, uh, and uh, uh, you always have uh, uh, to keep in mind uh, that. Regarding more specifically the question of uh, uh, national socialism, uh, uh, well, uh, um, in the last 20 years, uh, or uh, maybe in the last 30 years, uh, there have been uh, many activist uh, artistic projects uh, that uh, have uh, uh, stressed the continuities uh, between uh, uh, some aspects uh, of uh, uh, national socialism uh, and uh, the present. Uh, the main point uh, is uh, the detention camp, uh, of course. Uh, and there are always uh, uh, discussions uh, about uh, uh, the possibility to uh, call detention camps for migrants lager. Uh, if you call them lager, uh, you make a connection with uh, the history of uh, uh, national socialism. I think that uh, in uh, some uh, uh, occasions, uh, in specific conjunctures, uh, uh, such uh, an analogy can work uh, as uh, uh, a provocation in uh, a positive sense. Mm. But in specific conjunctures. Mm. Having said this, you have always uh, uh, to be aware of the fact that uh, uh, there is a, a huge difference between uh, uh, Nazi uh, extermination camps and uh, uh, detention camps for uh, uh, migrants. <laughs> uh, you, you cannot uh, uh, forget this difference. And what is important to add is that uh, the history of racism is characterized by continuities, but also by discontinuities. And we have uh, to analyze uh, uh, and struggle against uh, the present conjuncture of uh, racism that is uh, quite different uh, than uh, uh, the historical form of uh, racism that characterized uh, the national socialist uh, uh, regime. Hmm. This is important also in terms of, uh, let's say, a theory of uh, uh, racism, because a theory of racism has to emphasize uh, not only the continuities, but also the discontinuities. And this is because racism is a very flexible hmm, kind of uh, formation, mm -hmm. but also because uh, at the end of the day, racism is a reactive uh, formation, mm -hmm. which means that you cannot understand the contemporary formation of racism in Italy, for instance, without taking into account the challenge to racism that is posed by uh, movements and struggles of uh, migration. Mm. So if you emphasize uh, too much the continuity, the risk is that uh, uh, the flexibility of uh, racism and its reactive nature mm, go lost. Mm. Sandra, I, want, I wanted to point out one, uh, but I, and I think you have to respond on me, but uh, that, that's, <laughs> which is good, um, which is at the end of Katarina's uh, question is... I'm reading it. I'm just reading it. Okay, good. Um, yeah, and so after the dot, dot, dot that we have there, uh, she asks, uh, is it time for a European migrant strike that unites all? Isn't the lack of political rights something that unites migrant workers regardless of the country of origin? Um, and, you know, it, th this has been, you know, in 2015 in the U.S., uh, an important tactic. I mean, I was thinking about the, the, the 
the Day Without a Mexican project in the U.S., but also the Mexican Day Without a Woman project that linked to Neil Naminos. Um, would a would a would a migrant or something like a migrant strike at a European level be a, a feasible uh, political tactic? Okay, now I read uh, also the question. Hmm. Yeah. I read it on Facebook. <laughs> ah, okay. Hi, Katerina. Very nice uh, meeting you, although uh, in a virtual way. Uh, you are uh, raising a very important uh, issue. I was uh, speaking before of the general strike uh, of uh, migrant workers uh, in agriculture in Italy. And one of the reasons why uh, the situation became very tough, particularly in the south of Italy during uh, the pandemic, uh, was precisely the fact uh, that uh, uh, migrant workers from Eastern Europe uh, uh, could not travel, were not uh, uh, in the fields. This leads me to uh, make uh, uh, another point, which means that uh, uh, of course, uh, in uh, such a dialogue uh, for uh, want of time, <clears throat> we speak of migration uh, in uh, very general terms, but uh, needless to say, migration is uh, an abstraction. It is an abstraction that contains many different experiences uh, positions, uh, nationalities, uh, ethnicity, etc. And uh, uh, what is particularly apparent uh, in the fields, uh, in agriculture, uh, is that uh, bosses, uh, let's say capital, uh, uh, of course uses this uh, heterogeneity. And if you look uh, at uh, the fields, particularly in southern Italy, uh, Eastern European uh, migrants and African migrants uh, are divided and played against uh, each other. Mm. This happens, I repeat, in a very uh, clear way in the fields, uh, but of course it raises uh, a uh, more... Uh, general uh, problem. Huh? Care workers uh, from uh, Ukraine uh, usually do not think that they have something in common with uh, uh, African migrants uh, working, for instance, uh, in the construction sector. Hmm? So this is, of course, a field uh, uh, for political intervention. Hmm? a field uh, in which uh, uh, you can uh, also imagine, uh, as Caterina suggests, uh, a um, European migrant uh, strike that unites all. But this is not something that you can take for granted. Caterina speaks of the lack of political rights. Well, if you are uh, a uh, migrant worker from uh, Romania or Bulgaria in Italy, your legal status is quite different from the one of uh, an illegalized migrant from Senegal. It is quite different because uh, 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 you are a, a European citizen. Mm. So also from the point of view of uh, political uh, 
and uh, civil uh, rights, uh, there are huge differences. And you have to work those differences uh, in order to uh, make uh, what uh, you uh, wish, a European strike of migrants possible. Moira. Hmm. Ah, sì. Yes, yeah, Stella is, uh, is uh, referring to the old divide to conquer, but of course uh, it is so. Huh? Of course yeah. it is so. Mm -hmm. Mm. It happens not only in, uh, in the fields, not only in, in agriculture, it happens in uh, uh, the warehouses of logistics, for instance. Mm. The organization of, of labor is predicated upon uh, this uh, uh, old colonialist approach, uh, div uh, divide, conquer. And this approach takes on clearly uh, racist uh, characteristics. Mm -hmm. Michael, do you want to take uh, Moira's question? Well, the second part is definitely addresses to what I said about um, and about the insurgency not being organized. And I'm just trying to think through more Moira's point. Um, you know, there's some ways, but maybe uh, maybe I'm not thinking about right what 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 Moira is pointing to. You know, there's some ways in which there are moments of organization, for instance, the caravans that have traversed Mexico have been uh, organized and in, in organized in very interesting ways. Um, but the political um, effects of the migrations don't seem to be. I, I guess what I was trying to point out, but maybe Moira is right that I'm that I'm posing this in in not the the best way. Um, what I was trying to point out is that despite the fact that most migrants do not see their migration as part of a larger political project, that it nonetheless functions as such. I was trying to make, in some ways, um, it's a it's a strange argument. I, I can I can say, but it seems to me a necessary one to recognize the political effects of it, which is that there's in some ways an a, a objective consequences of the migrations, even if the actors themselves don't often think about them in such as part of a larger project. But I sense that you know I'm sense that um, I'm not quite I sense that I'm not quite thinking the same way that Moira is. That's why I'm that's why I'm fumbling and hesitating. I, I don't see after the dot, dot, dot in, in Moira's comments, uh, not only ethnic communitarian organization in border crossing as well, I guess other forms of organization, which certainly. I can read that, uh, wait a second. Okay. as well as in the reorganization of social cultural ties in camps, arrival cities, but the organization of recent strikes both in Italy and Germany indeed. Ah, okay. Mm. Right. No, the organization of strikes certainly fits with what, you know, the kind of political um, recognition of the project. Uh, that makes sense, but I think it, 
I do think it makes sense to think of it as going of the political import of going beyond um, the the level of these forms of organization. Let me think better how to formulate it because I think I, I I think I'm I'm inclined to agree with Moira and yet still feel like I was trying to get at something. So so let me keep thinking about that. Well, I think that uh, Moira uh, raises uh, an important issue because, uh, you know, even at sea, when uh, uh, you meet uh, migrants and refugees uh, in distress, uh, uh, it is quite easy to uh, note uh, that there are forms uh, of... Uh, organization uh, that uh, uh, enable border crossing. And these are forms of organization that work, uh, you know, family ties, uh, friendship, um, account of origin. Uh, sometimes uh, the organization uh, is uh, really uh, apparent. Other times, uh, uh, you just uh, get a sense of it, uh, but uh, it is usually a feature that characterizes uh, uh, border crossing. And even beyond the border crossing, uh, uh, there are uh, informal, um, quote and unquote, dirty dynamics uh, of uh, organization uh, that uh, prompt uh, the dynamics of uh, migration and that uh, can be uh, politicized. Mm -hmm. When you um, witness uh, uh, migrant struggles, uh, uh, in cities of arrival, as Moira writes, uh, uh, you usually uh, note that uh, behind the struggle uh, there are informal networks uh, that uh, build uh, uh, the condition of possibility of uh, the struggle uh, itself. So also from the point of view of uh, uh, the investigation uh, of uh, migration, I think it is uh, very important uh, uh, to map such uh, uh, informal, uh, informal networks, which are, of course, very different from uh, a formal organization. I and think... uh, go, go ahead. Did you have something, Sandra? No, no, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just thinking that we were getting near the end of our time. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And that it might be good for us to conclude. But if you had something before. No, no, I was just, uh, I was just uh, saying uh, two words uh, regarding the first point made by, by Moira. Um, you know, consumer strikes uh, is something that can be very powerful, uh, but usually in uh, very specific uh, conditions. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical uh, uh, about the possibility of uh, uh, a long-term campaign uh, based upon uh, the ethical uh, motivations uh, of consumers uh, to strike. It's not by accident that uh, Abu uh, made this proposal in the wake of the general strike of uh, May 21st. So what I think uh, can be effective is precisely this, uh, this link between uh, different forms of, uh, of strike. A consumer strike uh, usually work uh, uh, if uh, uh, there is a uh, stark politicization of the issue at stake. Um. Sandro, it's been a pleasure. Um, Michael, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> and thanks everyone for participating. It's 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 unfortunate that in these kinds of circumstances we can't uh, see and talk to you all after the event. But 
um, yeah, but thanks for your questions and thanks for the organizers for having us. Thank you very much. The performing resistance summer school is really a great project. We we are happy to have participated.